Welcome to the NC Everything Podcast. I'm your host, Curtis, and this is the bi-weekly show where I talk about everything that has anything to do with North Carolina. If this is your first time listening, thanks for, for joining me, and if you're a returning listener, thanks for coming back. Um, I got a whole lot to cover today. This seems like a, a long episode, but before we get started, check the description, and there will be a bunch of links down there. A lot of you returning listeners know this. If you look at the links, there's a link for the Facebook group where you can get even more NC everything. And if you're listening on a podcast player and you'd rather watch on YouTube, there's a link for the YouTube channel down there. There's also a link for Tasting NC, a show I do with my wife. We taste everything that has anything to do with North Carolina. And if you got an idea for an episode or want to reach out and say hello, the email address, uh, the NC everything podcast at gmail.com is also down there in the description. So, uh, I know it sounds like I'm rushing, but let's go ahead and get into the content. Now, one thing I want to say, we're going to be talking about the Donner Party today. And I guess I always assumed the Donner Party was, you know, 10 or 15 people. It was a, a small wagon train. But no, I think it was almost 100 people in this party. And it was not a small wagon train. And so I'm going to kind of go over there their uh, trip across the, the United States. Now, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time in North Carolina. George Donner was from North Carolina, and so that makes him a candidate for the NC Everything podcast, but uh, he did want to move around, and he did move around, so he didn't didn't spend a whole lot of time here. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, George, and, George and Jacob Donner, they were the two brothers in the Donner party, George and Jacob. They were born in Rowan County, and it was probably what the part of Rowan County that is now Davidson County. But like I said, he didn't stay in North Carolina very long. From North Carolina, they went to Kentucky. This was uh, around 1818. And then by 1828, they were moving to Illinois. Now, talking about them moving, the Donners are actually the pioneers of the Sangamon County, of Sangamon County, Illinois. So, started in North Carolina, and they pioneered Sangamon County, Illinois. Now, while they were up here in Illinois, they started seeing paintings of California. And that, that's the, the first time they thought about, you know, trying to leave the East and head out to California. And I guess the more they thought about it, the more they saw these, pain, the, these paintings, they got convinced that that was the, the thing they should do. So George puts his land up for sale in 1845. And then next spring, they started looking for anybody who wanted to join the caravan to California. So they, they made their plans, they got all the supplies they needed, and George was was made the leader. Now, at this point, I guess you could call this the Donner Party. And again, I thought George Donner was the, the leader of the Donner Party the whole time. Um, you'll see as this story goes, he started out with his own little party, and then they kind of joined up with the other, you know, it's there's some mingling and, you know, unmingling as we go. The trip to California begins on April 15th in Springfield, Illinois. George was age 62 at the start of the trip. Uh, with George Donner was his wife and his kids. Also, Jacob, his brother, was with him. Jacob also had his wife and his kids. And again, there was other travelers that joined up with them. You know, well, there's other families that joined up with them as they, as they got started here. But also... They had um, mule or wagon drivers. So these wagon drivers, they were there with their families. <clears throat> and so it was, you know, not necessarily servants, but they were, you know, employees for George Donner also traveling with them. Now, another guy traveling with them, his name comes up a lot, was James Fraser Reed. So James Reed was with them and he had his family. But the plan was to go from Illinois to California which was 2,500 miles. And I will say pretty much the majority of this podcast comes from a diary or several diaries that they had recovered from the Donner party. Um, not a lot of it is, you know, survivor accounts and stuff like that. But from Springfield, Illinois, they head for Independence, Missouri, which is 250 miles away. And this was where the beginning of the famous Oregon trail actually started was over there in, in uh, Independence, Missouri. Now, the thing is, kind of like today when you hike the Appalachian Trail, 
you're trying to time it right so you're not, you know, affected too much by by spring rains or winter freezes. Same thing here. If you're going 2,500 miles, you got to time everything just right so you're not caught up in the Rockies during the during the winter because that uh, that's the worst thing that can happen. And if you know anything about the Donner Party, that's exactly what did happen. So on May 10th, 1846, they finally arrive at Independence, Missouri, 250 miles away from their starting destination. They spend the next couple days getting more supplies. And then they leave on the 12th of June. No, I'm sorry. They leave on the 12th of May for California. So they leave a couple days later. So remember I was talking about intermingling on May 19th. They joined another wagon train, and this they had made it about 100 miles from Independence when they met it with this other wagon train. So now the, these two wagon trains join up, and this is led by Colonel William Henry Russell. On May 31st, 1846, another family joins the, the wagon train, and this was the Murphy family from Tennessee. Again, you don't have to necessarily remember these names, but you know, as they're traveling, more people, nobody wants to travel long. It's not safe to travel along some more people you know see this wagon train coming through and they're joining up by june 16th they're now at the platte river and this is 200 miles from fort laramie in in present-day wyoming on june 18th colonel william russell who was leader of this now large wagon train he gives up his position as captain he goes to fort laramie and trades his wagons in and gets mules because he's still going to travel with them. He does. He's not quitting the trip, but uh, he doesn't want to be in charge anymore. So he trades his wagons for mules. He feels like the, the mules will get him along a lot faster. By the end of June, they finally get to Fort Laramie. And this is, I guess, where the beginning of trouble started. Remember James Reed? Well, he meets a guy named James Kleiman, and he's an old mountain guy. He just come from California on horseback with a guy named Lan Lansford Hastings. Well, Lansford Hastings says he has found a, a new route, a shortcut. He calls and he named it, of course, Hastings Cutoff. Um, the problem was climbing. He Hastings was real excited by his new Hastings Cutoff, but climbing told the, the travelers he said you need to avoid Hastings Cutoff. Just take the regular route. Don't. Don't do the cutoff. It, it's not better, you know. Hastings, that idiot. He thinks uh, he thinks it's better, but don't do it. Stay on the normal road. On July seventeenth, they finally arrive at Independence Rock, and this is where the bog, the Boggs Company, um, and the Boggs Company is uh, another one of the groups that has joined up with the Donners and all of them. The Boggs Company comes across a rider who has a letter from Hastings, because Hastings is kind of like a guide, by the way. So he was, yes, he was coming from California, but he was just going to turn around and lead other people back to California. I forgot to mention that. So Hastings isn't just trying to get east. He's a, he's a guide. So when they get to Independence Rock, they get a letter from Hastings. The letter says all the immigrants on the road, meet him at Fort Bridger. And then he'll guide him through his famous Hastings cutoff. You know, he really wants them to use this cutoff. July 18th. The wagon train crosses the Continental Divide. Now they're a thousand miles from Independence, Missouri, where they started. Now on July nineteenth, the wagon train reaches the Little Sandy River, and this it was here that the the proper Donner Party actually got formed. You see, some of the travelers at this point at the Little Sandy River. This is when they had to make a decision: take the regular road or take Hastings Cutoff. Some of the travelers, they, they wanted to just stay on the regular road to California, you know, and, and listen to climbing and get stay away from Hastings Cutoff. Well, the other ones, they were like, well, if it's going to save us time, if it's easier, if it's better, we should take Hastings Cutoff. They thought the Hastings route would save them 400 miles because that's what everybody was saying. Now, in truth, the normal route was actually 125 miles shorter than Hastings Cutoff. Um, so... Climate was right. Hastings cut off was not really the way to go. So Donner and Reed, they decide they want to take Hastings cut off. Um, the, the rest of the party, well, other members of the party, they, they want to stay with the old route. But Donner and Reed, they feel like Hastings cut off would be the better way to go. So on July 20th, George Donner, 
he forms the Donner Party, and they separate from the rest of them, and they head left toward Fort Bridger, Hastings cut off. Now, when they get to Fort Bridger, they find out that Hastings, the guide, he already left. He had arrived, and he left a week earlier. And this sounds kind of cold and harsh, but it, it wasn't uncommon. That's another thing I realized doing this research. I thought they were all in one group moving, but the the wagon train essentially would be spread out over miles and miles and miles. Sometimes they were a week apart from each other. Now Hastings did leave instructions at Fort Bridger. Is that Fort Bridger? Yep. Yeah. Hastings did leave instructions at Fort Bridger for them to follow so that they could meet up with them. Well, they stay at Fort Bridger for four days and just kind of get some rest, and then they head out again. On August 6th, they arrive at Hennifer, Utah. They stop at the mouth of Echo Canyon. Here, they get another note from Hes from Hastings, and he tells them that the road ahead is impassable. He wants them to send somebody ahead to get further instructions. And what the further instructions were, since the road was impassable, Hastings had found a, a bypass for that, that impassable route. So now they're taking a, a detour off the off the detour. The problem was it wasn't a, a well beat down road, so they had to kind of bushwhack their way through, and it it really slowed them down. At this point, there's 87 people and 23 ra 23 wagons. On April 22nd, they enter the Salt Lake Valley, and at this point, they still have 600 miles to go. And it was somewhere around this time that they got another note from Hastings, and he tells them that they got a, a two day ride ahead, and he tells them that. You know, it's it's dry out there. there there's not going to be any water. So they got, according to Hastings' note, they got two days with no water. They got to go. So before they head out for this supposed two-day dry ride, they go to Red Redlam Spring, and that was the last source of water for a while. Then they head out across the Great Salt Lake Desert. Now, he said it was going to be a, a two-day ride with no water. Well, on their third day out in the desert, they do run out of water. And while they're out there, James Reed's oxen run off, and they never did find them again. They ultimately ended up spending five days out in the desert. And it turns out they didn't really do anything wrong. Hastings just underestimated how wide this desert was. By the time they got out of the desert, they lost 36 head of cattle. So to recuperate from the desert, once they got out, they spent about a week at the peak, at the foot of Pilot Peak. Now, this is where they realize that currently they don't have enough food to get them the rest of the way to California. So they sent out a guy named Charles Stanton and William McCutcheon. They sent, sent, sent him ahead to Fort Sutter to get more food so they can finish their trip. You know, it's easier to send these two riders and than everybody try to go out that way. On well, September 10th, they set out again. By the September 26th, they arrive at Humboldt River. And this is, this is where the Hastings Cutoff meets back in with the regular trail. And this is when they have a, the third official death. They were at Iron Point, Nevada, and they were struggling to get up this hill. Well, eventually, a, a fight breaks out between a guy named Milt Elliott, who worked for James Reed, and John Snyder, who was one of the, the drivers of the wagon. Reed pulls out his knife and tries to break the fight up, but this just kind of pisses everybody off. Eventually, somebody hits Reed over the head with the handle of a whip, and Reed turns around and stabs the guy in the chest with his knife. And that was um, that guy, John Snyder. So John Snyder ends up getting stabbed in the chest, and he dies a little while later. Now, at this point, you know, a few of them, they demanded that James Reed is, is hanged for murder. But ultimately, they, they decide not to hang him, and they just banish him. So at this point, James Reed has left the wagon train. And this was actually better for Reed. He was able to move faster by himself anyway. And so he pretty much heads on them off to California. But at this point, they really started realizing that they were behind. And if they didn't hurry, they were, they were going to get stuck in the mountains during winter. So at this point, they're really trying to, to hurry up and get down the, the Humboldt River. And if they're not already having m enough trouble... On the night of October 11th, the Paiute Indians killed 21 of the Donner Party's oxen. And uh, yeah, 21 oxen, that's that's a lot of food. And it wasn't long after that that they, uh, the natives come back and they steal 18 more. 
And the ones they didn't steal, they ended up wounding a bunch more that they didn't actually kill. So now about a hundred of their oxen are gone or messed up, too messed up to, to travel. And then there's another murder. See, the natives had taken almost all of the cattle. So a German immigrant named Wolffinger, he stops at the place called the Humboldt Sink to trade in his wagon. Well, there's two men, Joseph Reinhardt and Augustus Spitzer. Well, they decide to stay behind and, and help him. Well, then they end up coming back to the party without him. Later, they uh, Reinhardt, he confessed that he killed Wolffinger. And I'm assuming nothing ever really happened to him. On October 16th, the Donner Party arrives at the Truckee River. And this Truckee River is supposed to lead them through the Sierra Nevada. But by this point, the weather has already turned cold. And everybody's talking about how they're, they're worried it's going to start snowing soon and they're going to get stuck. By the end of October, um, all the food is almost gone. But luckily, Charles Santon returns from Sutter's Fort, and he brings seven mules loaded with all kinds of provisions and supplies. He's also got two Native American guides with him, um, Lewis and Salvador. And he tells them that the, the pass through the Sierra Nevada should be open for about another month if, if they can hurry. On October 28th, James Reed arrives at Fort Sumter. James Reed arrives at Sutter's Fort. And then on October 30th, uh, this is... I would say the beginning of the end. William Foster, on October 30th, William Foster accidentally shoots his brother-in-law, William Pike. William Pike dies a little while later. During the burial in Truckee Canyon, snow starts falling. And uh, that's, when the snow starts falling, that's, you know, a very ominous sign. Now, we'll see. Early November, they finally reached the foot of the main ridge near Truckee. And or near Truckee Lake. And this lake now is called Donner Lake. But they reached Donner Lake right there early November 1846. Now, the next morning, they try to start making it over the pass, which is now Donner Pass. Or the snow is already five feet deep. And this lake, Truckee Lake, which is now Donner Lake, this is where the pretty much end of the story is. This is where they become trapped. And again... They're not trapped all in one little group together. They didn't circle the wagons. They're, they're several miles apart, um, the different groups in the Donner Party. And keep in mind, they've traveled 2,500 miles at this point, and they're only 150 miles from Sutter's Fort. And so they, they realize they're in trouble, so they set up camp for the winter. And the, the, at this point, the Donner Party is essentially in two different sections. you got the, the Breen family is what they're calling it. It's different people, but you got the Breen family. They kind of take shelter in this old cabin near the lake. And the Donner Party, they're a few miles behind. But also, family names, you got the Fosters, the Murphys, the Pikes, the Eddies. Um, they're all in these old cabins around the lake. And then, of course, James Reed's family is still there. Yes, he was banished from the group, and he rode ahead, but his family is still in the Donner Party. And the rest of this podcast is going to come from a diary owned by Patrick Green. Um, he kept an extensive diary during all of this. And I'm not including everything from him, but I'm going to run through and kind of give you the highlights of how their, their winter went here. Um, by the end of November, most of the cattle that were available have been slaughtered. At this point, they, they assume they're going to be stuck until spring. And remember, this, this isn't North Carolina Springs. In the Rockies, they'll be lucky if the snow is melted by the end of April. You know, for us, we're out and about, you know, beginning of March, middle of March, sometimes the end of February, but you know, they, they assume they're going to be stuck till April or beginning of June. Now, almost immediately after everybody sets up their winter camp, it snows for eight straight days. By December 10th, the snow is about 10 feet deep. Now, on December 15th, Bayless Williams, one of the hired folks for uh, James Reed's party, he dies, they assume, of a fever. Now, on December 16th, 17 immigrants, they try to pick the healthiest, strongest ones. They head out on snowshoes to try to look for help. Now, I said it was 17, but after a couple of days, two of them returned. So now there's 15 snowshoers who are out there trying to find help. 
and yes, they're they're snowed in to the point they can't move their wagons and and supplies. But you know, if you're healthy enough, you can walk out, and that's what these guys are trying to do. By the end of December, six more men have died, and the snowshoe party has gotten lost somewhere in the mountains. And the snowshoe party did start losing people. One thing about the Donner Party that makes them so infamous is the cannibalism. That didn't actually start with the Donners or in the camps where the Donners was. That actually started with the snowshoers. Um, these snowshoers are now lost, and they ran out of supplies. So, and and a few of their companions have died. So they resort to cannibalism um, in order to in order to survive. I mean, um, they're hoping they can still make it out. <clears throat> and everything I read in the the diary, it sounds like it was with a heavy heart that they were eating their companions. It wasn't uh, something they they enjoyed. They wake up on the, in, inside the camps. They wake up on January seventh to realize Jay Jay Fostick has died in the middle of the night. Now back to the snowshoers on January ninth. Um, the snowshoers come across Lewis and Salvador. Lewis and Salvador were, were with the snowshoeing group. Um, and they had gotten separated. Well, they come across Lewis and Salvador, and Lewis and Salvador, and remember, those are Native American guides. They're pretty much just sitting down in the snow. They're exhausted. They can't move. So William Foster, he shoots these two because they were about to die anyway, and he believed that they needed to eat them to survive. So he shoots Lewis and Salvador, and they cannibalize the, these two men. On January, 12th, on January 12th, the snowshoers, they finally reach an a Indian village and they're able to at least feed themselves and get a few supplies. <clears throat> now, ultimately, the snowshoers, they're able to, to get out. Uh, a lot of them die. A lot of them die after they get out. But they're able to get out and get word out that there's people trapped in these mountains. And eventually, some search parties are formed. Meanwhile, back in the camp, uh, they're, they haven't resorted to the, the cannibalism yet, but they're, they have tanned the hides of some of their oxen, and they're literally living off these tanned hides. Now, as far as the rescue parties go, they called them reliefs. So you had the first relief, the second relief, and so on. By February 11th, the first relief, they, they reached Mule Springs. This is kind of the last stop before you get up into the, the bad areas. About a week later, the first relief actually arrives at the, the Donner camp or at Lake Donner. And they, they start handing out provisions and trying to help people. And on February 22nd, the first relief leaves the camp heading back to California with 23, 23 of the, the refugees with them. So they, they, they took a bunch, they brought supplies and they took a bunch of people out. And now the second relief is on the way. But before the second relief can get there, that's when cannibalism starts at the camp. Um, there's a lot of people dead now, and it's so cold, they're frozen. So this is when the the Donner, the true Donner Party starts cannibalism. On March 1st, the second relief arrives at the Donner Party. And when they leave, they take 17 of the, the immigrants with them. A few weeks later, the third relief shows up. And by the time they head out, they've taken 11 survivors with them. Sometime toward the end of March, George Donner dies. The fourth relief shows up, and they're horrified to find half-eaten corpses just laying around and dead everywhere. There's really only one living person left, and that's Louis Kesselberg. So the fourth relief, they leave on April 21st with Louis Kesselberg. And they arrive at Fort Sutter on April 29th, 1847. And I, I talk about them going to Fort Sutter. Fort Sutter is essentially the stopping point. If you made it to Fort Sutter, you made it. Now, on June 22nd, a guy named General Stephen Watts Kearney, he's heading east, and he reaches what they're now calling the cannibal camp. Uh, well, they, they see all these cannibalized bodies and everything. So him and his, his group, they bury all the bodies and burn down the cabin. So just to sum up, the whole group, the Donner Party was, the Donner Party proper was 89 people. 
81 of these 89 got trapped in the mountains. So out of all these 81 people, 41 died and 48 survived. And that's all I got on the Donner Party. I know that was a, a longer episode. Um, I think it was important to talk about the Donner Party and George Donner. It was a, a terrible, terrible tragedy. But I do think it's an a interesting story. Anyway, don't forget to write... Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe if you liked the episode, and check out the links and check out the links below for more NC everything. And now I'm pretty tired. I'm ready for some coffee and uh, maybe a biscuit. So uh, for you guys, I'll talk to you in a couple weeks. Mm -hmm.